I didn't beat The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening until the Switch remake, and after years of hearing the praise heaped on the game, I came away mostly unimpressed. The innate silliness of crossing over with other Nintendo games at points had faded with time, and the emotional moments fans pointed to were nice, but that's it. I had known about the game's big twist for years, but I was shocked to discover that it really wasn't a twist. The game constantly says that what happens when Link completes his quest will happen. It's not a surprise, it's an inevitability that could create a sense of melancholy, though I never felt it beyond Marin's pining for the outside world. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a Zelda game, so at the end of the day, I still had fun. But when compared to the rest of the series, Link's Awakening just didn't do much for me. And I don't think this is emblematic of the Switch version either. I tried multiple times over the years to play Link's Awakening DX, and each time, I found myself drifting away. So at least with the Switch version, I actually finished it. I was left curious though, as many started calling for remakes of Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons in the same vein. Now, I had been aware of these games for years, but there never seemed to be much conversation around them. They were developed by Capcom and featured a system that linked the two games together. While Oracle of Ages focused more on puzzles, Seasons would lead into the combat. They were always something I wanted to play, but never had the chance to. Well, it's time to change that, as John and I step into the worlds of Labrina and Holodrum and see how they hold up. John has taken Oracle of Ages, and I volunteered for Oracle of Seasons, since the mechanic of changing seasons seemed more unique than another time travel Zelda story. So be sure to check out his opinions on that game as well, it's available right now. As for me, let's begin my journey into the Oracle of Seasons, and it all begins rather impressively for the Game Boy Color. Link is riding on Epona through a field before coming upon Hyrule Castle. He goes inside, and as he approaches the Triforce, he's transported to the land of Holodrum before giving us that classic fanfare. It's reminiscent of Link's Awakening, but perhaps grander as he's literally answering the call to adventure. I mean, just as a save file is chosen, he's asked to accept the quest. So what is this adventure? Well, he's found by the dancer Din, who's part of a troop of performers. They inform you that she's been taking care of Link since he arrived, and her dance has the power to lift people's spirits. Even Impa is part of the group, serving as their cook. And it's a really cute scene as Link attempts to awkwardly dance with a talented young girl. It's at this point that I have to mention that this is by far my favorite design of Link. He strikes the perfect balance between classic and new, young and adult, and it's a look that I wish was used a bit more often. Not that you see it much in Oracle of Seasons, as it uses the same sprite from Link's Awakening. It's not long before trouble begins though, as Onox, self-declared General of Darkness, appears and uses a whirlwind to scatter the troop, never to be seen again, and kidnaps Din, declaring her the Oracle of Seasons. Link tries to protect her, but the kid doesn't even have a sword, so that goes about as well as you'd expect. Onox immediately enacts the rest of his plan, imprisoning Din in a crystal and burying the temple that houses the four seasoned spirits in order to throw the seasons of Holodrum into disarray and cause both people and nature to perish. And sure enough, the Temple of Seasons begins sinking in relative spectacular fashion as the seasons begin to go out of whack across the land. Link awakens in the now frigid land where Impa reveals that she was tasked by Zelda to become part of Din's troop and escort her to Hyrule in order to keep the dancer safe. However, Onox's attack has left her injured, so now it's up to Link to seek out the Maku tree in Horon Village and discover what he must do to save Holodrum. There, he learns of the eight essences of nature he must find in order to restore the Maku tree's power and break through the barrier that Onox has erected around himself and Din. And that's the premise of Oracle of Seasons. All in all, a solid start that had me intrigued thanks to a new villain and the goddess Din recontextualized as an oracle that gives balance to the world. It's a fun expansion on what was established and that's just enough because the rest of the game, like most 2D Zeldas, is pretty light on plot. However, reaching the Maku Tree takes a bit more than simply walking over to it. Horon Village serves as the central hub in Seasons and there's quite a bit to see. There's a boy that gives a hint to the possibilities of the different seasons. There's a man looking for a wooden bird for his cuckoo clock, indicating a future trading quest. A couple asking Link for advice in raising their newborn baby. A house full of tutorial parrots. And a shop that isn't open quite yet. Most importantly, at least for now, there's the mayor who is fascinated by Gasha seeds, which grow based on the planter's deeds and produce nuts. These nuts often contain special rings that can then be taken to the appraisal shop. 
For 20 rupees, the shop owner will reveal what kind of ring it is and allow Link to equip it. Now, upon first discovering the rings, I found it to be a fantastic system full of potential. It's not often that Zelda allows players to tweak their playstyle to better suit themselves. Want to make cracked floors not break? There's a ring for that. Want your bombs or boomerang to be more powerful? There's a ring for that. Want to avoid electrical damage? There's a ring for that. But I soon realized that there was also a major problem that heavily limited their usefulness. Link can only carry one ring at a time, and if he wants to change it, he must return to the shop, choose the replacement from the list, and then remember to actually equip it. While it is possible to expand the amount of rings Link can carry on him in the future, I still wish my entire collection was more available. As it stands, I had to guess what would be most useful in the coming trials. And speaking of trials, Link must travel to the west of the village in order to take the Hero Trial. This is a simple mini-dungeon to get players accustomed to the concept of dungeons, where a wooden sword awaits at the end. With this, the world finally opens up, allowing Link to cut past bushes and access the Maku Tree. Sword in hand, I explored the rest of the town, finding a mysterious portal that I couldn't reach below ground, a strange looking tree, and a man needing a nearby lantern lit. It's the typical set of tasks that I'll be able to complete after a few trips to the dungeons. Fortunately, I'm already well on my way thanks to the gnarled key that the Maku Tree gives Link. There's still not many places to go, but I do find a man with a cat stuck in a tree that seems part of the eventual trading quest, a chest I can't reach, a place where I could plant a Gasha seed, and Malin, who's naturally worried about her father Talon, who still hasn't returned from Mount Kuko. By this point, I was feeling pretty excited. It had been a while since I had played a Zelda game, and to be back in the gameplay loop felt great. I was already theorizing about what these breadcrumbs might lead me to. But eventually, I found where the key went and revealed the first dungeon, the Gnarled Root. And if you've ever played the original Legend of Zelda, the look and placement of this dungeon should feel familiar, a small island where the dungeon is located within an old tree. They're basically identical, and there's a good reason for that. The founder of Flagship, Yoshiki Okamoto, originally proposed to Shigeru Miyamoto that his team could create a Game Boy Color remake of The Legend of Zelda. Based on the success of that, the team could then attempt to create a more ambitious game. However, his team wanted to skip the remake and get right to that next game. This caused development to flounder as they focused more on story until Okamoto asked Miyamoto for advice. Miyamoto suggested that they create a Triforce series with three interconnected games that each focused on a different power of it. Mystical Seed of Power was the only one officially shown and contained elements that would eventually become Oracle of Seasons, such as the idea of changing the world's seasons, though it was Zelda who held this power originally. However, finding a way for three games to interconnect proved too complex and Mystical Seed of Courage was cancelled while the remaining games became the Oracle duology. This rocky development is why many of the bosses and seasons were also in the original game and the aforementioned placement of this first dungeon. But what is the Gnarled Root dungeon actually like, since this is my first taste of what Seasons has to offer? Well, it's a pretty standard introduction to what Link will have to do in dungeons. Push a block to open doors, defeat enemies to reveal keys that take Link further in, find a map that provides a better idea of where to go, everything you'd expect from a Zelda game at this point. That said, it does have some ideas of its own that truly helped the game stand out fantastically as time went on. For now though, Link has minecarts, and they're fine, serving as a way to travel through specific doors and needing to flip switches in order to reach new areas. They work as a puzzle solving mechanic, but the funniest aspect for me was adding context to something I heard long ago. If you've ever played the Minish Cap, which was also developed by Capcom's flagship team, you might have noticed that the minecarts in those dungeons are wicked fast. Apparently, the reason for that is that many players complained that the minecarts in the Oracle game slowed things down too much. Hence, the speed boost. It feels even more amusing to me now in context because it's not like the minecarts are any slower than any other parts of the game, and there's some decent puzzles to enjoy. But who am I to stand in the way of speedy progress? Now, while I call it a basic dungeon, that doesn't mean it was mindless. I did die after all as I discovered some bombs, used them on a nearby wall, and was promptly accosted by blades that closed in when Link was nearby, and new enemies that would chase him across certain sections. Neither are bad on their own, but they're rough when combined, especially when I have to immediately backtrack because I don't have a key. But speaking of the damage, jeez, it can catch you off guard at times. There is very little invincibility frames, meaning Link can lose several hearts to a determined enemy extremely quickly. 
So I respawn, work my way back to where I was, get insult added to injury as the key was just several steps to the right that I never explored, and return to the death traps. I had him a bit better figured out this time, allowing me to enter the next room where a mini boss awaited, a pair of Garaya brothers who passed a boomerang back and forth to each other. Thankfully their pattern isn't too bad considering I only have half a heart and bam, there's a checkpoint in case I die again. On the other side is a set of stairs that reveal that the 2D sections from Link's Awakening will return, though it's still simple at this point. But hey, I get a satchel full of ember seeds allowing me to finally light some torches and make progress. Thanks to the compass, I can easily backtrack to my missing chest, grab the boss key, and dodge wallmasters to reach my first boss, Aquamentus, who just so happened to be the first boss in the original Zelda. The sprite's pretty great for the time, especially when compared to the original, and it immediately catches me off guard with a charging attack. That's all Aquamentus really has though, and a few sword swipes are all it takes to finish it off. And there I had it, the first dungeon was complete, and Link earned the first essence of nature. I honestly felt like the game had a supremely strong start. Things were still simple, but it was reminding me why I liked classic Zelda. With the essence at hand, the Maku Tree gives Link a clue on where to go next, saying he must find the Lost Temple of Seasons that sank beneath the earth. Not much to go on, but my attention was immediately divided thanks to the arrival of the Witch Syrup's apprentice, Maple. What I didn't expect was a kind of minigame where her and Link's items scatter everywhere, and he must scramble to pick them up before her, possibly netting even more goodies. But I felt like I lost out on this deal, so I only intentionally ran into her once more when it was necessary for the trading quest. What I didn't realize until afterward is that she carries one of the pieces of heart in the game to upgrade Link's health. Suddenly, it made way more sense why there was a ring to increase encounters with her, but it wasn't a big deal missing out on it. That brought me back to Horon Village, where I was able to appraise my new rings from Gasha Nuts and visit the home of the man who complained about not being able to see. Thanks to my new Ember Seeds, I was able to light the nearby torch and receive the Kuko Dex in return, officially starting the trading quest. I won't be covering all the steps, but I did have two takeaways as I worked on it throughout my playthrough. First is that it's one of the most important things to do in the game, as it's the only way to earn a more powerful sword. Without finishing it, Link is stuck using a wooden sword for the entire game. The other is that I struggled to remember where to go for certain items, which delayed me finishing the quest in the first place. Figuring out who to give the final item to can be incredibly tricky if you don't already have it in hand, as they're the one who instructs how to obtain the new sword. But I'll save that for when I actually get it. With all my business at Horon Village out of the way, it was time to burn my way past the shrubs to the east and start exploring more, eventually coming across a hooded figure in a ribbon talking about the land of Sabrosia. Of course it's all a secret, so it's time to get stealthy. That essentially means staying out of their field of vision using nearby trees, which isn't too bad, until there's a trick moment near the end where they leave the screen then come back in soon after. That made me have to restart, but fair enough, it kept me on my toes. With success comes the reveal of a portal, and on the other side is the underground world of Sabrosia. And let me say this right now, I love Sabrosia. It's basically a mini overworld, but it feels different from a lot of other Zelda games despite being conceptually similar. Rather than the same version of the map with a twist like in A Link to the Past or even Oracle of Ages, this is wholly unique and simply adds a different flavor that I found refreshing. By chatting with the Sabrosians, I soon learned that a strange temple had fallen into their world and a nearby dance hall was offering a prize. So it's time for a simple dance mini game that I'm terrible at. It takes a few tries, but I finally got the hang of it and was rewarded with a boomerang. Boomerang in hand, I explore the rest of Sabrosia that's currently available to me and learn that ore chunks are the currency down here, not rupees, but I need to dig for them if I want anything. Not a big deal though considering I can't even access the shop. What I can access though is the Temple of Seasons where I'm greeted by the spirits of the seasons and instructed to take the Rod of Seasons in hand. That's a lot of seasons. However, it's useless on its own and I must reach the season spirits if I'm going to wield their power. Luckily enough, I already have the boomerang needed to reach winter. This proved to be another aspect of Oracle of Seasons that both surprised and delighted me. I thought that all the seasons would be available to me right away, which seemed like a lot all at once. I don't know why I thought the game would take that route in retrospect, but I enjoy a trinket that has to be powered up over time where you're given a chance to learn what makes each aspect so unique. And with a small breakdown of what winter allows and a new sense of direction to the next essence from the Maku tree, it was time to take my leave of Sabrosia and head for the second dungeon. Well, first I had to get a quick tutorial on how to use the Rod of Seasons. It's basically like shrinking in the Minish Cap. I had to find a tree stump, jump on top, then swing the rod to change the season. 
simple enough as each swing would invoke the change with them going in order once I had every season spirit. What I failed to mention before though was that the seasons in Holodrum were completely out of whack, with each area stuck in a different one, while Horon Village would change with each visit, effectively demonstrating at least some of the differences between them. But that was the challenge with the Rod of Seasons, figuring out which season was needed to progress or reach something new. It's a neat concept that every screen had four variations, something that seemed more ambitious to critics at the time of release, as it really used the Game Boy Color's, well, color. Nowadays I'm more drawn in by the concept itself, but the variations are nice enough. With Winter at my disposal, Link could now freeze bodies of water to cross to new areas while certain trees withered allowing him to actually move beyond them. Naturally, there's new obstacles as well, such as large piles of snow of varying sizes. It should also be noted that the season never affects interiors, making it impossible to freeze the water inside a cave to reach a chest on the other side. But those high piles of snow do allow me to reach a chimney that I can jump down to act like Santa and get a shovel for my troubles. With this, I can dig up dirt to find rupees like normal, as well as dig up the smaller piles of snow to progress. And this is something else I found myself enjoying about Oracle of Seasons. There's a lot of new ideas on how to handle classic roadblocks, even after playing later Zelda games. Another example of this is soon revealed as mystery seeds are introduced as part of the same satchel as the ember seeds, and these wake up owl statues for hints basically. I know they had other uses at points, but outside of one in particular, I can't remember them. But this does reveal that the satchel is more diverse than past Zelda games as eventually Link will discover five different seeds in total. This includes scent seeds which attract monsters to them and I never used, Pegasus seeds which acted like the Pegasus boots allowing Link to move faster and eventually jump farther, and Gale seeds which allow Link to warp around Holodrome but only to seed trees. I love the idea of the Pegasus boots being a temporary power-up that can be used whenever you want, giving it a different flavor than usual. And fast travel is always appreciated, though I did find myself wishing there were a few more trees to warp to. More annoying is selecting the satchel itself. Every time I chose to equip it, I also had to pick the seed. But if I want to choose a different seed while equipped with it, I have to unequip and re-equip it. It sounds minor, but it slows down the pace, which is unfortunate considering I felt Oracle of Seasons does way better in how much it requires Link to change items in the game. Outside the satchel, I was only mildly annoyed in a few instances about the constant switching, usually when a puzzle room required three or more items. In any case, by following the path and using Winter, I soon discovered the second dungeon, Snake's Remains. There's not much to say about this one as it does feel like a gradual progression in difficulty while introducing some new enemies and laying out puzzles that utilize the item of the dungeon, the power bracelet. With this I can do the usual lifting of pots, but also push cylinders that block certain rooms. It plays into the idea of new concepts for existing items, though admittedly it's nothing that groundbreaking in this case. That also applies to the mid-boss of the dungeon as it saw the return of Facade from Link's Awakening. Now I did die to Facade mainly because I ran out of bombs and he refused to send out enemies that replenished them. Round 2 went more smoothly and outside of a new rotating platform so did the rest of the dungeon. When Dodongo appeared as the dungeon boss, continuing the original Zelda streak, I was a little disappointed that both bosses of the Power Bracelet dungeon required bombs instead of that item. But there was at least a twist with Dodongo, helpfully communicated by a nearby owl statue. The bombs themselves didn't damage it, but it did stun Dodongo. That in turn allowed me to pick up the dino and toss it into the nearby spikes. Nothing too difficult, but I was amused by the small twist on the classic enemy. With that done, I was next instructed by the Maku tree to head west to Spool Swamp. Before that, there is the standard post-dungeon routine I began forming, returning to Horon Village to see what was new, appraising any rings I found, and see if anything had changed. In this case, the store now carried a strange flute that did absolutely nothing, but I figured at the time that it would be my fast travel item. Considering that ended up being a seed, the flute was used for something quite different, but I'll get into what that was a bit later. I ended up traveling north past the large boulders thanks to the power bracelet only to discover a boxing ring minigame. No items, only fists, with the rules more like sumo wrestling as we have to punch each other out of the ring. But hey, at least this guy says, hey come on come on, like Terry Bogard of Fatal Fury, though I think that's unintentional. It'd be pretty wild if a game developed by Capcom and published by Nintendo contained a reference to SNK. Either way, I beat the punk after longer than I care to admit, and win Ricky's boxing gloves. Who's Ricky? Not a clue. At least not until I travel a little farther in and discover a kangaroo in a grotto. He tells Link how he lost his boxing gloves and, well, we're all set. 
And by all set, I mean Link gets to ride in Ricky's pouch while he punches enemies and easily jumps over gaps along the way to the swamp. It's so freaking satisfying and sadly ends all too soon as Ricky gets Link to the higher ground, otherwise inaccessible, and says his farewell. Really, this whole section is pretty fun as Link has to drain the nearby river to even make it to the swamp proper, and that involves a mini dungeon that takes advantage of the new Pegasus Seeds. As I went along, I eventually discovered a group of moblins bullying a creature known as Moosh. Moosh is able to scare them away with a ground pound, but they soon come back only to be defeated by Link. With that, Link becomes able to ride Moosh and float over large gaps, along with the aforementioned ground pound. It also turns my strange flute into Moosh's flute, and... Look, I mean Moosh is fine, but I had way more fun with Ricky, and I'd never get to use that kangaroo again as I later learned. I was actually really curious about this because while I was aware that Link had animal friends in the Oracle games, I had no idea they were limited to one per playthrough. There's Ricky, Moosh, and Dimitri the Dodongo, who I would meet later. So what determines which friend I'd get? Well, remember how I bought the strange flute in Horon? That locked me to Moosh. If I had gone to Sabrosia and returned to the dance hall, I would have won another flute there that would become Dimitri's. If I did neither, then Ricky would have given me his flute after his section. Curse my own preparedness! What is cool though is that the landscape of certain sections of Holodrome actually changed to suit the chosen animal buddy, better reflecting their capabilities. Something I'd never pick up on in this playthrough, but a potentially neat discovery on replay. For now, it's time to travel with Moosh and discover another hidden portal to another section of Sabrosia. It's not far from where I was originally, but it goes over the ore chunks and what's available in the store. Namely, a ribbon for progress, a heart piece, and, after the ribbon is bought, a bomb bag expansion. It's a great haul. It's also somewhat amusing to me that there's a Sabrosian beach where a young girl that everyone idolizes awaits, Rosa. While it's not the same beyond the beach setting, I did get Marin vibes from the whole thing. But by giving her the ribbon, she agrees to go on a date with Link, and she just so happens to have a key that'll open any door. Just what I need for the Temple of Seasons, which will unlock the way to the Spirit of Summer. With this, I can change the season in the swamp and use the vines to reach the third dungeon, Poison Moth's Lair. And I think it's here that things began taking a turn for me in Oracle of Seasons. Whereas the first two dungeons only took me around 20 to 25 minutes to complete, this one was about double at 45 minutes. The enemies were more specialized, the puzzles required precise block pushing that took me a while to decipher, and the method of progression often left me lost. I also died a lot from sheer impatience, which highlighted something else about the game. While there are fairies that greatly heal Link, there are no bottles to save them for later. The only option to revive Link is much later in the game, and costs way more than any other Zelda title previously. Rupees aren't exactly hard to find, but the price of certain items can drain your wallet faster than you'd think. Basically, there was no safety net, which meant every time I died, I had to redo the steps of switching out my items to defeat certain enemies and make it past the reset puzzles. It's not so bad the first time, but constantly repeating it wore on me. It was also the first appearance of something else that would be the bane of this playthrough. Ways to interact with things that I just didn't think of. In this case, the dungeon rewarded me with the rock's feather, allowing Link to jump. There are also trampolines that allow him to reach a higher floor. But it took me a long time to realize that I could push those trampolines into different positions to reach new rooms. In retrospect, it seems obvious since I knew to push a pot onto a switch to keep it held down, yet it never clicked for me here. And this wouldn't be the last time, not even in this dungeon. That's because the mini-boss was a trio of squids that shot energy at Link but I couldn't figure out how to damage them. The sword didn't work, bombs didn't work, the boomerang did nothing, ditto for the seeds in my satchel, and the rock's feather didn't hurt enemies. And I'd get hurt if I got too close to them with the power bracelet, right? So I didn't try that, ended up dying, and got frustrated at the thought of having to go through most of the dungeon all over again. So I looked up a guide. And sure enough, the power bracelet was the key. I had to pick them up, toss them on land, and then I could swipe the squids with my sword. The one thing I logicked myself out of was the answer. And I swear I didn't come across any tips for it like I did for Dodongo. The funny thing is, there was barely any dungeon left between the mini boss and the actual boss, who ended up being a revised Mothula from A Link to the Past. And it was so easy in comparison. Some of its attacks could be attacked for hearts, and its pattern was relatively simple. The only real threat were the pits that would reset the fight if Link fell into them. 
and even they posed little issue. But hey, three essences down, five to go. However, I think there's little point in being so granular with my Oracle of Seasons experience from this point on because I definitely started to sour on it. There were too many instances of me needing to refer to a guide to figure out what to do. Maybe it wouldn't have been a problem if I didn't have to do it as much, but it felt like it just kept happening. Take for instance Moosh. When I first got him, I assumed that he was able to jump over three holes in a row, and that's what made him special. Yet as I explore the overworld, I see this long line of holes that are impossible for him to jump across. So I go everywhere in the vain hope of finding some clue, and while I do discover some goodies, it's not what I need. That's because it turns out Moosh can glide, something I only discovered by mashing the jump button in frustration. The funny thing is, I did try to make him glide before, but by holding down the jump button instead. So nope, I rapidly press the button and sure enough, I can make it to the other side with no issue. Another standout moment involves the next location, the Sunken City. It's the gateway to Eastern Mount Kuko where Dungeon Number 4 resides, and it's here that Link properly meets Dimitri the Dodongo and uses the animal to swim up waterfalls and eventually obtain the Zora's flippers, allowing Link to both swim and dive. Thanks to these, he can then use a spot on the northern edge of the sunken city to travel up the mountain. It's honestly a pretty fun section that once again feels different to other Zelda adventures. The problem is that the diving spot is not marked on the map or mentioned by the people of the Sunken City at all after that point. So when I had to go back up to Mount Kuko later in the game after a bit of a break, I had completely forgotten where it was with no way of figuring it out again without blind luck or a guide. I used a guide. Finally, there's the bomb flower I need to use in Sabrosia to access one of the Season Spirit Rooms. I found it easy enough through basic exploration, but I didn't know what it actually was as I hadn't gone to the temple first where they would explain needing a better bomb. Before this point, I never needed to visit the temple to figure out how to access the next room. So when I found the suspicious item, I figured something else in Sabrosia would use it eventually. That's how it had worked up until this point. So after even more wandering to the point that I forgot about the bomb flower at all, a guide informed me that all I needed to do was pick it up with my power bracelet. Oh. Well then. In retrospect, all these solutions seem simple and obvious. It's an older game so they expect you to play and remember this stuff. No need to remind players if they've been gone for a while, and the answer is there if you experiment enough or look in every nook and cranny. But a lot of these issues edge close to PC adventure game logic. Try every item on every thing until something clicks. It doesn't make sense at the time, but once it works, then you realize the logic. There's fun in that, but things never felt this cryptic in A Link to the Past. I know Link's Awakening had moments like this for me as well though, so something about the puzzles in the Game Boy titles just feel more… well, puzzling. While I was playing, I couldn't quite figure out why I had gone from absolutely loving Oracle of Seasons at first to slowly feeling that spark die out the farther I went. It was when I spoke to John about it that something clicked. He told me that Oracle of Ages was more linear than Seasons because that game was more of its own creation. Seasons is built upon the idea of an original Zelda remake, and that's reflected time and again thanks to this more open and less guided adventure and every boss appearing before with the exception of the final two. Every time I felt I had guidance, the game blossomed for me. Every time I felt there was no clear direction, I soured. And to be clear, I still think this is a stronger game than Link's Awakening thanks to many of its gameplay additions. The season gimmick is strong with each one changing the overworld in multiple ways. I already covered winter, but summer dries up certain pools of water and grows climbable vines, while spring causes the water level to rise and flowers to bloom, allowing Link to cut past them. There's also a special flower that will launch him to higher places. Finally, autumn fills pits with leaves and ripens rock mushrooms, allowing them to be removed. It doesn't sound like much when you're not playing, but in action, it's fun to look in an area and try to figure out which one would let me reach a new place. This does lead to a weakness though, and that's the limitation of what areas get the seasonal change. If I change the season and begin exploring to figure out how to best utilize it, it's possible that I could leave the area of effect, meaning the season is reset. It's a mildly annoying hiccup that forced me to pay attention to how the world was divided. However, there are certain puzzles where multiple seasonal effects can be seen at once, and it forces me to figure out the right order to move forward while also circling back to the stump, allowing me to change to the next season and make a little more progress. 
It doesn't happen often, but those stood out as some of the most entertaining puzzles. The seasons also tie into this game's version of The Lost Woods, where Link is instructed to not only go a certain direction, but for it to be a certain season as well. And this leads me back to the trading quest and the only way to obtain a better sword. It eventually ends at the windmill where the music man there trades Link a phonograph. But what do you actually do with it? Well, there's a Deku scrub near the Lost Woods who's looking for something to dance to, and in exchange he'll provide special instructions on how to reach something special. It's no different than actual progress, but this scrub is kind of easy to forget, especially because there are plenty all over Holodrum. If you kept up with the trading quest, you would have the phonograph at this point, allowing the trade to occur by just naturally talking to it. But if you're like me and missed a step before reaching this point, well, you're gonna have to remember him on your own, wander around until you stumble upon the scrub again, or default back to a guide, like I did. I just really didn't want to use a wooden sword anymore, and honestly, thank goodness I looked it up because the new noble sword likely made my encounter with the final boss way easier than it would have been otherwise. I'll get to that mess in due time. Before that, I wanted to compliment what I think is one of the strongest aspects of Oracle of Seasons, its items. I've already spoken on how it swerved when I thought I knew what was coming. The seed satchel being the key to fire, speed, and teleportation felt fresh, and the flute calling in an animal friend instead of tying into fast travel is something that would be fun to see return. Well, speaking of the seeds, they were also used for the slingshot obtained in the fourth dungeon, effectively building upon the satchel's idea, though with the same weaknesses. But Dungeon 5 was where I was blown away in terms of concepts. Up until that point, I kept seeing platforms with N or S on them and didn't know what to make of them. I just assumed that they tied into the returning hookshot. Except there's no hookshot in Seasons. It's the magnetic gloves, with each use changing the polarity, pushing or pulling Link away from those platforms and allowing him to cross. Not only that, but they were used in conjunction with rotating platforms where I had to quickly switch and unique enemies that also switched their poles to avoid Link. There was even a puzzle where I had to pull dark nuts into a pit. I love seeing this new idea used in so many different ways. The sixth dungeon awarded the magic boomerang that Link could control once thrown, which ended up being a little underutilized, while dungeon seven premiered Rock's cape, an upgrade to Rock's feather that allowed Link to glide over long distances. This would later return to great effect in the Minish Cap, and it's just as fun here. The final item was the Hyper Slingshot, and to be honest, it was kind of a letdown compared to what came before, only just shooting seeds in a spread pattern. It just couldn't match the imagination of what came before. But still, I really enjoyed how different this set felt overall. And apparently, after doing some research, some of the items could be upgraded even further thanks to the secret system. Because I wasn't playing a linked game, none of these secrets ever appeared, but if I was, it's possible to take the noble sword I found and upgrade it to the master sword or bombs into bomb shoes. It's a neat idea that isn't wholly necessary, but it does give something for the third oracle to do. After all, Din got seasons and Nehru is featured in ages, what was Furore the oracle of? Well, with each essence recovered, the Maku tree grows, and eventually Furore can be found in a special room as the Oracle of Secrets, implementing the codes discovered in the Link games. But again, it's not something I could really do this playthrough. I do want to talk about this game's bosses though, as I found myself utterly perplexed or figuring them out instantly. Take the fourth dungeon mini-boss, a wizard that would split himself into three, then fire energy balls at Link. I knew I had to light the torches in the middle to make them solid, but then nothing. It felt like I was missing something, which I was, the wizard. It turns out the two of them were phantoms and the real one had to be hit. I strained my eyes for differences, but for the life of me, I couldn't find any. So I died, I retried, and did my best to dodge as I went through the crapshoot of actually hitting the damn thing. And then there was Goma waiting at the end. I swear I hit every inch of its body and used every item at my disposal, but I couldn't figure out how to actually damage it. It turns out I simply had to slash at its big claw, which I was convinced I did to no effect. But after looking at my footage, I did hit it. I just failed to notice the flashing to indicate it was hit. Whoops. Turns out realizing that makes Goma a pushover, as I could even get hearts from the mini Gomas it would send out. There's nothing quite like a Zelda game to make you feel extraordinarily dumb. The thing is, I died to most of the bosses. Dig Dogger in Dungeon 5 certainly got me, but I knew how to beat it. I just needed to bring it together. Manhandler's return in Dungeon 6 took me a while to figure out, especially with its core being electrified, but I did it. 
The final dungeon's boss even felt thrilling as it was entirely original and required me to use the rocks cape to figure out its pattern and avoid damage. I just had a lot of fun with it. But that fun died with the final boss, Onox. I fully intended to go into this fight as prepared as possible. I had all but one heart, I had gotten the noble sword, and I went to the witch syrup to buy a magic potion that would revive Link if he died. For 300 rupees. I had nearly 600 and that still felt steep. But hey, at least I'd be able to take on Onox with no problem, right? Ha! While the small gauntlet leading to his boss room was nothing that bad, the fight against him vividly reminded me of my least favorite Oracle of Seasons moments. I had no idea what to do, every attack did nothing, every item was useless. He used a ball and chain and there were seemingly special circles on the ground. Maybe I had to draw him into attacking those, but nothing worked. So I died, used the magic potion, and then died again. 300 rupees gone in a flash. Finally, I looked it up. It turns out what I had to do this entire time was a spin attack. That would get through his armor. Nothing in the game prepared me for this. No boss required it. I can't even remember if there was an offhand comment about the spin attack doing more damage. But that's what I had to do. Except now it was with a single health bar. And as it turns out, Onox has three forms. After defeating him with the spin attacks, he brings Din out to use as a shield, and I eventually figured out that she had to be pushed away with the Rod of Seasons before I could safely continue my spin attacks. All the while, he had a new tornado move that proved tricky to dodge. But I did it, and I was rewarded with his final true form, a 2D boss fight against a dark dragon. And let me tell you, this thing sucks. I'm already drained from the first two fights, now I have to learn an erratic pattern of jumping on hands, avoiding claws and beams, and doing my best to strike his head. It just feels like it has so much health, and I died again, and again, and again. It took me a solid hour to finally beat Onox, as I had to redo the small gauntlet and his first two forms every time. I can't think of another final boss in Zelda to give me this much trouble. There's a sense of relief to beating him, but it's not exactly satisfying, especially when I came into this attempting to be prepared. At least Oracle of Seasons is finished and Din is saved, providing a fun series of images and a tease that really sold the idea of these being linked games. That's because it turns out that this was all a plan by Komei and Kotake in a bid to resurrect Ganon. The chaos Onox caused allowed them to light one of the needed flames, and their plan elsewhere would light the other. It's a great hook and I really did feel the urge to jump right into Oracle of Ages. The password may be a little unwieldy, but there was something exciting about seeing the evil twins talking about their plans again at the start of Ages. How well does it pay off? Well, I have to refer to John for that one. Oracle of Seasons may have had its ups and downs, but when it clicks, it feels fantastic. Despite my issues with unclear goals and the necessity of trying every item on every thing, I still think it's a stronger game than Link's Awakening learning from what that game did well. The areas are more expansive, the gimmick is more interesting, the items are clever, and I simply felt more surprised. I do think it would be more fun upon revisit with the knowledge of how to do some of the things that stumped me on this initial playthrough, because when I had a sense of direction, I had so much fun. I think it deserves a second look, and perhaps a remake like Link's Awakening on the Switch would help in that. It's uneven, but fun with a terrible final boss that was far harder than I ever expected. But if you want to know even more about these games, be sure to check out John's video on Oracle of Ages as he covers the structure of that game, how it differs, and more on the development side of things. Like these games, it's absolutely worth checking out if you haven't already. He even goes into what linking the games actually does. Despite my issues, I'm so glad I finally crossed this off my Zelda bucket list. Now I just need to finish Oracle of Ages and Spirit Tracks, and I'll have beaten every game in the series. What about you though? Have you played the Oracle games, and what did you think? Let me know in the comments, and as always, please consider subscribing to Good Vibes Gaming, hitting the like button, and ringing that bell. We also have a Patreon at patreon.com slash gvgaming with plenty of extra perks. Until next time, bye!